Hi, I'm Carl, and in this video we're going to go over questions 43 to 46 of section 3 of the Pink Booklet. So this is a question about the humidity of air and how it varies at different temperatures and what this means for inhalation and exhalation um, and what temperature might do in that. Uh, and I want to point out something in the paragraph that's given, which I think is quite useful. Um, there are these cooling surfaces that are present um, in the nasal passages so when air is exhaled um, you get this sort of cooling of the air and we're told here that such cooling causes water vapor to condense from the air onto the surfaces of the nasal passages so the body recovers some of the water added to the air upon inhalation and that creates a really humid environment so whenever um, air is then inhaled again um, you can get this sort of quick equil equilibration to body temperature and it becomes saturated. Okay, so question 43 says, consider a human with a body temperature of 37 inhaling air of 25 degrees C with 25% relative humidity, which the following is closest to the mass of the water added to each liter of air as it becomes saturated and equilibrates to body temperature. Okay, so we're going to be looking at this graph, which I've copied out here and um, there's two points then we need to plot. The first is going to be the 25 degrees C at 25% um, percent relative humidity. So that's going to be um, here. And we can see that the milligrams per liter of water is around five. And then at 37 degrees C at 100% humidity, um, because the air will be sort of saturated at this point at exhalation, uh, what would that be? So it's around here, so just over 40. And so that's a, a gap of around 40 milligrams. Um, sort of the height between these two dots is going to be 40 milligrams. Um, and so that gives us an answer for 43 of C. 44 says, which of the following statements is correct? So let's go through them. A says, as the temperature of the ambient air increases, its humidity has less effect on the amount of water lost in exhaled air. So the amount of water that's lost in exhaled air um, is mainly prevented um, by these cooling structures that exist. And so the actual temperature of the ambient air itself um, doesn't necessarily have much of an effect B says, as the temperature of the ambient air increases, its humidity is less effect on the amount of water added to inhaled air. So inhaled air becomes immediately saturated because of this humid environment that's placed in the nasal cavities um, because of the structures we talked about. So that's not going to be true either. C says, less cooling of the air passing through the nasal passages um, during exhalation results in more water being recovered. So more cooling of the air, in fact, would, would cause more water being recovered because the more the air cools um, the less it can the less humidity it can hold and you can see that in this graph as the temperature decreases the amount of water in the air itself decreases and what that means is whenever you cool down the air um, this air condenses in the nasal cavities and that's what allows the next breath to be saturated so d is sort of summing this up pretty well, it says more cooling of the air passing through the nasal passages during exhalation results in more water being recovered because more of it is going to come out of the air, more of it will condense and so more of it will be recovered. So the answer for 44 is going to be D. 45 says consider a kangaroo rat inhaling air of 30 degrees C with 25% relative humidity. So let's put on the dots as we go along here. So it's 30 degrees C, 25% relative humidity. So that is here. And it's exhaling saturated air at 27 degrees. Which of the following is closest to the net loss of water from the kangaroo rat for every litre of exhaled air? So again, we're just looking at the difference in the height um, between these uh, two dots. And to me, that looks like around 20 milligrams. It's closer certainly to 20 than it is to anything else. So the answer for this one. Um, which is question 45, is going to be A. And then finally, we've got question 46, which says, which one of the following would not improve heat exchange in the nasal passages? 
So we're looking for what would not improve hate exchange. A says short nasal passages, and that wouldn't improve hate exchange. It's reducing the, the surface area and the amount of contact that the nasal passages is having with the air, um, and that's required for heat exchange. Um, so short nasal passages would um, not improve heat exchange. But let's talk about the other ones just to rule them out. Although the answer for this one from what we've read so far has to be A. Um, B says narrow nasal passages would improve it. And it seems a little bit counterintuitive because if they're narrow, they're going to have less surface area. But the way to think of it is that if you've got a volume of air in um, a nasal passage like this and in a nasal passage like this, um, it's going to be sort of great. It's going to have greater contact with the, the surface, even though there's a lower surface area um, because there's less of it all of the air is going to be um, exposed to all of the nasal passage, whereas if it's in a larger one, it'll be more spread out. And sort of if you want to think of the sort of the density of the air that's been forced through it will be a little bit less. Um, C says nasal passages with a highly folded surface. Again, this is going to increase the surface area, and that's important for heat exchange to take place. It's the opposite of answer A. And D says nasal passages with a countercurrent blood flow. Um, so a countercurrent blood flow is described in the paragraph above and we're told that this sort of vascular heat exchange surface is important for um, the cooling of the air and so we're told that does improve the heat exchange so we know that's not going to be the answer so that leaves us with a short nasal passages and that makes sense so that was questions 43 to 46 i hope that helped